Questing for Titles, a System Apocalypse short story by Tao Wang, narrated by Avon Shore. Golden arches on an elevated billboard glowed in the dark of the night, illuminated internally by mana lamps and offering the surroundings its only source of illumination. The lights glowed brighter than it ever did before, which allowed the words beneath the sign to stand out even more starkly. Both words and viscera decorated the billboard. Over a million served at this location. Dried blood, poisoned spittle, and globules of torn flesh covered one portion of the sign, much of it originating from the ground beneath the sign and leading all the way to the sole standing building in its expansive parking lot. To the right of the group that stared at the billboard stood their goal, little concrete barriers helping to designate the drive through windows. Knee-high, clear glass windows offered a view of the inside, where overpowered fluorescent lights powered by mana illuminated the familiar red and yellow upholstery and white plastic tables. In the corners, where light failed to penetrate, shadow figures moved within. Of course, only one of the parties would recognize what was normal per fluorescent lights. Of the three that stood before the building, one was native human, barely breaking five feet in height, clad in a simple white blouse and black slacks that gave her a business casual demeanor. As she stood, she fiddled with the glasses that she still wore, frames adjusted to remove any magnification or light refraction and offer additional data on the system world. For most, though, it was the other two who would have brought an exclamation of surprise, at least five years back, unless you were at a cosplay convention, before the system apocalypse, before the changing of everything. One of the figures was over six and a half feet tall, muscled like a steroid-ridden bodybuilder with a simple orange mohawk. More importantly, his green skin and tusks gave clear indication of the Hakarta's origins. The space orc wore an eccentric combination of modern tactical wear and silver medieval armor over his body, tactivest holding the double-bladed axe and the pair of belted beam pistols. The third figure was a Menahune, a three-foot-tall, chubby and happy pink figure who carried a bow slung over his shoulder and a quiver of arrows by his hip. Mostly, though, the Menahune watched the surroundings, fingers twitching by his side, mana flowing from its eyes and body. The system has a sense of humor, it seems. This is the 998th such establishment, and there are hundreds more turned into a dungeon, the Hakarta said. It doesn't normally highlight individual establishments when they are of great cultural importance. Well, they did serve over a million humans, the Menahune said. An errant gust of wind brought the stench of rotting corpses to the group. It was strange, but even the smell of rotting flesh had changed since the system. As monsters and aliens whose body compositions were entirely different from the carbon-based life forms of Earth made their way over. This one mixed with the usual breakdown of human and animal flesh, also consisted of a slight, almost sweet smell, reminiscent of smoked paprika. Smoked paprika, cinnamon, and of course, rotten eggs. We told you before, if you wish to speak, speak up, the Menahune shouted. The youngster flinched, tucking her head low. But at the urgings of the Menahune, she looked up and saw his status once more. Kaya's zeal. Brotherhood of Title Guides, Yellow Initiate, Slayer of Goblins, Partaker of Feasts, The Variable Discipline of Moya, Appreciator of the Music of Kaywaz, More, Level 18 Kismarno's Guide, AV14, Con Variable, 9X Mill 43, 254 of 254, Mana Absorb, Xnag, Regen, Overflow, W minus GRAS, 540 of 540. As always, it took her a few seconds to put together the information that had been showcased to her, comparing it to the same information that she had on her sheet. Shi Ping, Wen, Earth Food Guide, Level 2, AM. Health, Convair, 160 of 160. Mana, Absorbo Reg, 180 of 180. The status screen alteration that she had paid for 11 restaurants back had made understanding other people's status information so much easier. 
She knew that there were actual classes and skills that would fix her view of the system completely, but the cost of doing that was too high, at least until such time as she made enough for a goal. She was going to earn enough to buy the Ares Armored Food Truck Fireball version 2.3 no matter what. In the meantime, penny-pinching on things that she absolutely did not require, like new skills to read the system, was definitely something she could do. It wasn't as if she hadn't done it before, when she'd scrimped and saved to put herself through chef school, all the while working late into the evenings at her father's restaurant serving fried noodles that she still hadn't received a chef class from the system on integration, but a foodie class from the random blogs that she had posted on the internet rankled. Sure, she had a decent following, but it hadn't been her passion. Cooking had been. Then again, she wasn't exactly sure if she would accept a chef class now. After all, it still felt a little like cheating. Using system skills to make food taste better, make your ingredients stretch a little, give buffs, it didn't feel like proper cooking, not the way she had learnt from her father, from Chef Ward. It was also why so many of the chefs she ran into couldn't cook any better than a first-year student. They were so focused on their skills, they'd forgotten their skills. Still, a portion of the savings was being set aside for a class reset, just in case she changed her mind. There definitely was something to be said about being able to give full buffs to a party for eating your food. It certainly made for good money. And a chef or not, she was her father's daughter, and Yai Ping knew that money mattered if you wanted to keep cooking. Well, Kaez asked. The company was innovative for its ability to serve food quickly and cheaply and with good quality, at first. And then it became quick and cheap, Shi Peng said, along with being a sign of American cultural dominance. You speak, but so often your words make no sense. Chogfall rumbled. Shi Ping looked over at the Hakarta, who shook his head. Dominance is a matter of strength, not culture. Chogfall Borellis, wearer of the indigo sash, partaker of feasts, flowers division, landslide architect, master of the sixth and eleventh form of updef puzzles, famed hunter of Vaxex, asteroid bounty hunter, pilgrim of the jungle, Level 9 Weekly Disaster, MPV-14 Version 3. Con Variable, 13X Mill 678, 3,780 of 3,780. Mana Absorb, Xnag Regen Overflow W minus Flax 4 plus Envar 82 KS, 1,270 of 1,270. Oh, they had strength, Shi Ping said. They had the fastest planes, the most modern technological pieces, aircraft carriers and ICBMs, and, of course, nukes. Much good it did when the system came. It fared worst because it had too few people of worthiness, Chogfall said, pounding his chest. Strength from skills and classes, from warriors, is all that matters. And titles, Kayaz said. And titles. Shi Peng lowered her head again and fell silent rather than argue, as it would get her nowhere. In truth, there was little to be argued with. The countries which had been packed with people had been both fortunate and tragic at the same time. They'd been targeted with higher-level creatures, some of which had rampaged and massacred populations, and others which had just found new lairs after their initial surprise, coming out only to snack. Due to the higher volume and higher level of their monsters, They'd lost more people as a percentage of population than other, less dense countries and cities. But dense as many of their cities had been, it had also meant that they had more people. With danger came opportunity. Opportunity to level, to kill and keep killing. Those who managed to survive the initial days and to increase their levels managed to pile advantage on advantage, working the hard way to climb higher and higher in level. Of course, more died than survived, but the uncaring mathematics of numbers meant that heroic survivors began to shine. A few, a very few, even managed to kill the titanic monsters that had been portaled into their cities, working in small groups or alone. Titles, levels, and prestige followed those victories. As for other cities, the sheer volume and numbers finished them off. 
at least where the cities had not been destroyed entirely, all of which lent itself to the argument that individuals and levels were more important than technology. For cities that tried the same with shop-bought equipment often found themselves unable to wield the equipment or unable to secure their victories. Chogfall sniffed. Now, come, let us clear this dungeon. Shi Peng bobbed her head and fell in behind the hulking Hakarta as he strolled towards the doors. Behind the human female, Kaya's hopped along, his bow unslung from his back. He kept a little further back than Shi Peng, the human having activated a simple shield enchantment to keep herself protected. Halfway across the empty parking lot, cracked asphalt filled with fallen leaves and plastic bags, the first trap sprung. From the ground, Weeds that had forced themselves through gaps exploded into motion, tearing at Chogfall's legs as they attempted to slide through his armored jumpsuit and drain his blood. The weeds slithered and twisted, striking at the master class's feet and armored jumpsuit. They thrashed, desperate to find purchase, but failed as his high constitution and defenses refused to give way to the stabbing tendrils of the vegetation. He lifted his foot just once, and it tore the vegetation away. Another step stomped down, and a skill made fire rush through the cracks, catching upon each of the bio-traps hidden beneath. A high, keening whine rose from the ground as the weeds died, burning away. Come, let us be done with this, Chogfall said, his walk never hesitating, even as new traps rose to strike at him. Muttering quiet agreement, the pair followed. A bare forty minutes later, the trio stood in the blasted, torn remnants of the kitchen. The dungeon had warped the structure of the building on the inside, making the dining room multiple sizes larger, the corridor to the bathrooms and the bathrooms themselves teeming with monsters, and finally, the kitchen where they found the Alpha. The battles had been quick, bloody affairs. Using his axe to carve his way through the animated, virus-ridden, mana-created corpses, Chogfall had led the way. None of the creatures could touch him, and the occasional one that he missed, Kaya's shot down. Shi Ping took little part in the fight, firing the beam pistol in her hand occasionally, but mostly spending the time cowering. At the feet of Chogfall lay the Alpha, an overweight Middle Eastern man whose torn uniform did nothing to hide his bulging belly or the pustulant sores that covered his lower body. Every so often, the body twitched, as one of the many controlling parasites that made the zombie creatures escaped, only to be crushed underfoot. Without the controlling parasite, the parasites were on a long journey to final death. Level 40 dungeon. Pitiful. Chogfall spat to the side. He glared at the monsters within, before gesturing everyone outwards. As he left, he triggered the numerous explosives he'd left behind the incendiary devices burning the dungeon to the ground behind him. Only when the structural integrity of the dungeon failed did the Hakarta nod to himself in satisfaction. Dungeon destroyed. Plus 1,982 experience. One more, yes, he said, and glared at Kayaz as he dismissed the notification. Yes, Kayaz nodded his head quickly at his employer. And I'll be satisfied with this title. Chogfall snarled. It'll be a title for certain, Kayaz said. He pointed to the burning remnants of the dungeon. But you have to acquire the loot from within for destroying the dungeon. I know, Chogfall said. Why do you think we wait here? He shook his head. This title better be worth it, guide. I only promised that it would be a rare title. I'm certain of that much, but more details are uncertain. As you were informed, Kayaz said, straightening a little. You know that title guiding is a difficult matter, especially on new dungeon worlds. Chogfall grunted. Looking around, the man gestured for the group to leave. They had a long way to go before they made it to the next dungeon. The creak of metal echoed throughout the machine, the hiss of hydraulics shifting the numerous legs, a dull and unending accompaniment to the evening's ride. The vehicle that traversed the sloped, majestic heights of the Nepalese Alps walked on accordion-like, hydraulically-powered feet, bearing the large, bullet-shaped body across the rough terrain. 
The cavernous insides of the walking behemoth had been divided into multiple cabins for rest, while riggers, mechanics, and gunmen ran around on the curved railing outside. Occasional blasts emanated from the vehicle to destroy incoming monsters, lighting up the surroundings with their fire. The Ugdam had been pieced together from the hull of a cruise ship, reshaped and modified with multiple legs and layers of mobile tank armor added to it. Armor which had been reworked by machinists, mechanics, and blacksmiths as necessary to provide additional protection. Slapped on, shop-purchased beam weaponry had been added to the vehicle, with cabling run against the empty interior bulkheads to the mana engine, which replaced the engine of yore. Of course, the mana engine was a tenth the size of the old oil burner, along with being significantly stronger. All of which meant that much of the internal drivers had been ripped out, to give even more space for the backup mana batteries and the hydraulics that moved the legs. With a total of 12 different limbs, the UG dam had significant backups and flexibility in movement. Unfortunately, that came with the necessary drawback of drawing monsters on the regular. Luckily, between the captain, vice captains, and ship owners combined skills along with the unceasing watch of the gunmen, most monsters on their path were easily dealt with. I can't wait for the teleportation networks to be finished like a civilized world, Chogfall said, not for the first or fifteenth time, to Shi Ping. The young lady ducked her head, lips pressed together in irritation. Chogfall snorted. Kaya spoke up offering a placating smile. Even if they did have one, the dungeons we go to are unlikely to be on it. Bah, it's because these dungeons are so scattered. Chogfall trailed off as the door to the shared dining room creaked open. Pushing against the heavy metal obstruction, a Jarek strode in, glancing around. Her eyes fell upon Chogfall, widening into a wide grin that showcased her jackal-like features even further as she strolled over. Behind, a grimsar followed after, spotting Kayas and offering a short nod in acknowledgement. Chogfall, so good to see you. The female Jarek looked up purposely at Chogfall's status, then let her gaze fall as she continued. Still no luck acquiring a new title? Edval. Chogfall greeted her curtly, ignoring her barb. At her next sentence, he looked up automatically. Edval Lura, Zeus's chosen, betrothed of the Lodra clan, Tushai Vars, valedictory of the Eleven Lakes, mistress of the Six Scarves and Fourteen Spotted Lilies, Rolling Thunder Level 9, M. HP, 2984 of 2984. MP, 3,214 of 3,214. You. Yes, just got it on our last run, Edval said, preening. Bateka was right. We managed to finish the labors of this Hercules and acquire a title. Hercules, Chogfall said. Some mythical human, supposedly with great strength. Couldn't be more than a few hundred, though, Edval said, sniffing. And it was a bit of a cheat, using what we know. The last task was a bit difficult, having to lift an earth elemental for an evening. You lifted it yourself? Shi Peng said, surprised. Well, no. We used a series of gravitic beams to hold it off the ground, and when the night was over, we blasted it to bits. But setting it up took forever, Edval said. Still, it was worth the title. Again, she grinned her mouth lolling open and tongue sticking out as she looked at Chogfall. Human titles really are worth it. Taunted again, Chogfall leaned forwards. His curiosity finally gave way to his irritation and jealousy, and he asked to see it. Title, Zeus's Chosen, semi-unique. As one of the prolific god's favorite children, Hercules labored mightily before he gained his father's respect and achieved godhood. Like him, you have completed the seven labors, and with it, you have received the god's blessing as well. Effect, plus 50 strength, plus 25 endurance, plus 20% lightning resistance, stackable. That is a good title, Chogfall said finally, his face twisting in bitterness as he was forced to admit it. Yes, made all the harder because we had to find alphas for them all. 
Edval replied. We didn't know that till we had completed it all the way through once. Could have saved a lot of time if we had known. Right, Bateka? It's a semi-unique title. You know what that means, Bateka said, crossing his arms under his barrel-like chest. I don't, Shi Ping said. Bateka turned to stare at Shi Ping, his lips turning up into a sneer when he noticed her race. Before he could retort, Kaya's cut in. Semi-unique titles are a term we title seekers came up with ourselves. It's to denote titles that are likely impossible to replicate, but we're uncertain. Why uncertain? Because the system can, and has, changed its mind. But for the time being, we'd assume it's unique, Kaya said. Shi Peng opened her mouth to ask further, but was silenced by Edval talking over her as she spoke to Chogfall. You still on your original hunt? Yes. Must be close to finishing it, I would think. Maybe. Oh, come on now. You know I would have shared mine with you. I have before. Not shareable, Chogfall said, eyes narrowing. But what about your next one? Edval looked uncomfortable, turning away, and Chogfall smirked. I thought so. Not that into sharing, are we? They're all new. There's a chance they might even be unique, Edval said. Exactly. An awkward silence fell between the group before Edval stood up. Well, I guess another time then. She strode out, followed soon after by Bateka. Silence grew between the remaining trio before Kaya's asked what everyone had been thinking. What is she doing here? Sadly, none of the group had an answer to that question. Just suspicions. It was early the next morning when they were finally alighted from their transportation the Ugdam's multifaceted legs rising and falling, carrying the crew and the remaining passengers away with deceptive speed. Skills and a mixture of earth and system tech powered the moving craft, leaving the trio alone in the vast wilderness of the Southern Alps. Like its state pre-system, the Alps continued to be missing towering trees and dense vegetation, sticking to low-level alpine brush. A long hike later, the group came across the abandoned town. In four years since its abandonment, the wilderness had taken over the outpost of civilization. Buildings lying crumbled, walls torn, roads cracked. Without a system shop or anyone fighting for it, the town had reverted to its base level, becoming pristine wilderness. All but their target. Eyes set upon the sullied and familiar golden symbol. The group ran down the reclaimed street its different and raised texture marking its difference from the normal wilderness they'd journeyed through. Eyes flicked from side to side, checking out climbing vines and crumbled walls as they searched for monsters. To their surprise, they encountered no monsters at all, even the occasional maddened attacker missing. The lack of danger only heightened the tension. Chogfall speeding up to such an extent, Shi Ping was panting as she expended more energy than even the system could regenerate. For all their haste, they were too late. As they arrived at the dungeon, they were surprised to see a familiar duo exit the building covered in gore. What are you doing here? Chogfall snarled. Nothing, Edval smirked, and then tapped her wrist. The signal set off the high explosive grenades left within, causing the building to collapse as the dungeon was destroyed. The rush of mana as the system dealt with the destruction drew a hissed breath from the surprised group while Chogfall unslung his double-bladed axe. You! Chogfall took three threatening steps forward, raising his axe which burst into flame. You thieving title thief! Really, is that the best you can do? Edval said. There's no rule against running a dungeon. Her eyes glazed for a second. Then she frowned as she did not see what she sought. Though this one seems to be a failure as well. I should carve you up and send you back to your pack in pieces, Chogfall threatened. In the back, the pair of title guides had slunk away, followed closely by Shi Ping as the title seekers snarled at one another. Go ahead, I dare you. See what my pack does to you and your family, Edval said, jutting her jaw forward. In one hand, held low, dancing pinpoints of light formed and swirled around her fingers. Chogfall cursed at her. 
switching to galactic. His hands trembled as he cursed her, but he made no move to act, cognizant of the greater implication of an attack. As representatives of their clan and family, conflicts could spiral faster than he cared for. And while certain leeway for such conflict could be expected in a dungeon world, he was certain that Edval had taken steps to ensure this incident would become highly inflammatory. Fine, Chogfall said eventually, but don't expect me to be quiet about this insult. Edval let out a yowling snigger, her head thrown back. Go ahead, if you think any title seeker cares. Those who can't safeguard their goals do not deserve their titles. Chugfall refused to turn back as he slung his axe back onto his back, stalking over to Xiping and Kayaz. Come, let us go. The air stinks around here. His words only elicited even more laughter that followed them as they trudged away. As they walked, Xipeng watched Chogfall communicate with the local transportation companies, seeking an emergency pickup. It seemed his irritation had burnt away his parsimonious nature. It was when they were well away, standing on an empty hillside awaiting their pickup, that Chogfall strove to break the silence. They can't learn of the title, can they? He said. Kayaz shrugged. Not unless Batekas purchased more skills. You've seen the notifications we get. Chogfall snorted. I've seen what you see, but you title guides are always so secretive about your skills. Kayaz smiled at this while Shipeng rolled her eyes. She stopped when Chogfall fixed her with a heated gaze. Find me another dungeon, woman. He paused, then leaned forward. And if I find out that you were the one who told them about our objective, Shipeng quailed as she shook her head from side to side in mute denial. It was probably a matter of simple deduction, Kayaz said. It's not as if there's much else out here worth doing. He waved his hand around the barren, low-leveled zone they stood within. Especially since we didn't try to hide our pickup point, like I recommended. Chogfall let out a low growl at the implied criticism. He turned away, searching the sky for their transportation, even if there was no way it would have arrived already. Behind him, Shi Ping bobbed ahead in thanks as Caius rolled his eyes and mouthed the word, sorry, to the female guide. Two days later, the group stared down at the blasted remains of the city of Malacca, the coastal city that had been colonized by the Portuguese, Dutch, and the British before returning to the Malay people and the various other cultures that had assimilated into the city over its six centuries of occupation, had once again been conquered by another invading force. Long known for its ability to assimilate new immigrants, the local population was still struggling to handle their new conquerors. It did not help that the invaders had a close resemblance to local legends of Southeast Asian vampires, the pangolin, with their floating heads and exposed lung and intestines, that the aliens were jellyfish-like flying creatures whose internal organs were thus exposed to sight but not free hanging, did little to appease the locals especially since the shape-shifting jellyfish aliens had sought to integrate by changing their faces to look like the local humans. Wearer of the indigo sash Borellus, it is a pleasure to have you here, the junior administrator said as it floated up. It bobbed low, the boneless body flopping forward, lungs and intestines squishing together and then uncompressing. That Chiping could see partly into the lungs and the intestines where the aliens' partially digested food lay made her turn green. Administrator, Chogfall said, I understand my requests have been approved. Arms crossed, he glowered at the men. Yes, completely. We've even blocked a pair of additional requests for the same matter. The administrator bobbed again. We were surprised since the dungeon itself is so low level. We had the local sapiens running it for food. Shi Ping made a face at the mention. The local surroundings were quite high level due to its proximity to various nautical dungeons and a few plantations, forcing the human populace to find alternate forms of food. If they destroyed it, it would compress the options for cheap food. Then again, it was five years in. And while there were still children growing up and assimilating into the system, most survivors should have leveled by now, or had chosen not to. As for those, Shipping could only look upon them with disdain. 
I see, Chogfall glowered, making the poor administrator compress its body in fear. A few more murmured words, and the entire group followed the gloop-sweating alien down the streets. As they walked, Shi Ping could not help but look around. Malacca itself had changed significantly. The colonial-era buildings that had lined the streets in downtown Malacca now stood side by side to towering alien edifices. A crystal spiral, a lump-sized hillock with numerous doors of stone, a twisting trio of trees that connected over the street via wooden walkways were the most uncommon. Skyscrapers of metal and glass, twisting high into the sky in defiance of physics, beside stone, yellow-washed, peranican houses were a painful contrast. One that, Xi Peng noted, were being protested against by a small but determined trio of old ladies of Chinese and Malay descent, each holding signs and walking up and down the streets. Xi Peng's lips twisted up as she bowed to the first lady to cross her path, and twisted even further in amusement as she received the donation notification. Donate to the Restoration of Traditional Malacca Fund. Help us buy Earth-owned plots of land and restore traditional Malacca. Donate? Yes, no. A moment's hesitation, and then Xi Ping sent them a hundred credits. She dismissed the automated thank you while hurrying after the trio of aliens. Not that she was the only one following along behind the invaders. In the middle of the day, the sun-baked streets of the city were filled with humans and aliens, all concentrated in the safe zone as they went about their daily business. As a group, they came to the familiar site of the Golden Arches, the building connected to others in the traditional row house format of this particular street. Standing outside the dungeon, barred from entry by a pair of nervous-looking human polis and another junior administrator, was Edval and her guide. You, what are you trying to do? Chogfall snarled. Do you not have better titles to acquire? Me? I'm just here to cheer you on, Edval said, all innocent-like. After all, you've worked so hard and paid so much. That last elicited another growl from Chogfall. Though we wanted to make sure we were here to applaud your acquisition. You. We're thankful to the wearer of the indigo sash for his purchase of the dungeon rights, the original junior administrator said, speaking up quickly. Its presence has caused some issues with the local population. Really? Shi Peng said. That seemed strange, considering what he had said earlier. Yes, the meat acquired has been very controversial, something to do with local customs. It's too complicated for us to understand, especially since multiple, um, imans, the other administrator supplied. Imans have different interpretations. Shi Peng frowned, but rather than wait for her to inquire further, Chogfall strode right to the glass doors that separated the dungeon from the street. He did not turn around as he entered the building, disappearing from view as the dungeon warped him away into its own instance. Rather than let themselves be left behind, Kaya's grabbed Shi Peng and dragged the human in after the impatient Hakarta. Kaya's prodded the burnt and crisped body on the ground, flipping it over. The hallways of the building were a pale gray of faded concrete mixed with the occasional splash of yellowed paint and the dark ombre of clay. As he moved the corpse, its smell assaulted Kaya's, dispersing motes of crisped fat and skin. These look familiar, Kaya's said. Boar, humanoid, wild boar, Shi Peng said. She crouched down, touching the corpse to loot it before pulling the corpse into her inventory. Pig, could you call it a pig if it was mana warped? Flesh was anathema to the Muslim population that inhabited the city. Of course, the Chinese and Nayana members had no issue with it, unless one considered eating semi-sapient creatures an issue, which some might. I get why they'd be upset now. Kayaz cocked his head to the side to ask, but was interrupted by the resounding crash and the shrieks of dying monsters ahead of them. He sighed, gesturing for Shi Peng to hurry up as they looted and stored bodies. Chogfal had not waited for either of them tearing through the dungeon with a vengeance. Even the hardened stone of the dungeon had seen numerous cracks, in one case being broken open entirely to reveal another room. Not that any of it mattered to Chogfall. 
He so outleveled the Zone 10 to 19 dungeon that he wasn't even getting any experience. Even Xiping and Kaya's were receiving but a trickle, and that was mostly because of the system taking pity on them. Certainly, they were barely helping with the actual fight. Normally, they'd have complained. Being carried through dungeons and gaining some experience for it had been part of their contracts. But considering how Chogfall was acting and the numerous delays they'd faced, neither felt inclined to protest. In the end, by the time they made it to the final boss, Chogfall was standing over the gross, minibus-sized mother sow, its body split into two by a single strike. The Hakarta was breathing hard, more from suppressed fury than exertion, it seemed, forcing calm upon himself. Boss, we good here? Kaya's asked. Chogfall's class might be powerful in short bursts, but it also had the tendency to overstimulate the disaster's emotions at times. Yes, plant the bombs, Chogfall said. Already done. Chogfall nodded, striding over to the newly revealed dungeon core. He slapped his hand down on it, leaving a clay-formed mine around the edge before he gestured for the team to leave. Together, the trio scrambled out, stopping only long enough for Shi Peng to finish looting the boss pig and adjust her inventory to take it in. Outside, Chogfall triggered the explosives the moment Shi Peng scrambled out. The rumble of contained explosions, covered by the hastily thrown up temporary shielding by the administrators, contained the explosions. The building the fast food restaurant dungeon had once been in shuddered and twisted, before it finally collapsed in on itself as the furious explosions were reflected back. Once it was finished, Chogfall dove right into the building once more, ignoring the burning remnants and tossing concrete walls and rebar aside with careless abandon. The team moved back, allowing the master class to work in silence. Finally, the Hakarta walked out, holding a yellow-wrapped food substance in hand, ash and dust streaming from his form. Done? Kaya's asked, staring at Chogfall as he reached the waiting group. There had been no talk while they waited for Chogfall. The Hakarta pursed his lips, glaring into empty space. Long seconds passed after he put the loot away. And then, finally, a familiar blue notification formed. Congratulations. Title acquired. Looter of the Hamburgers. You have shown a spirited and dedicated passion for hamburgers and their most famous dispenser. You have destroyed a thousand such dungeon dispensaries and eluded them all. Effect, plus 10% damage in dungeons, plus 25% chance of acquiring food-related loot in addition to normal looting opportunities, plus 5% experience gain when combating traditional hamburger-related monsters. Lips pursed. Chogfall stared at the titles. It was a good title, with decent effects. The addition of food loot opportunities could make a big difference in certain biomes. It could make or break certain kinds of expeditions, in both revenue levels and survivability. The experience gain was disappointing, though, restricted as it was, though the dungeon damage increase could be useful. Overall, as a title that had taken long Earth months, it was decent. But was it worth it? There was only one way to tell. What did you get? Edval leaned forward, almost as if she wanted to see the hidden notification. There were, of course, skills that could allow her to do that. But like any good title hunter, Chogfall had skills to block such title acquisition. Let us see. Chogfall's hand raised, and he tapped into the title hunter's library. A few quick swipes, a simple authentication, and he finished registering the title. Long moments passed, while Edval and the guides waited impatiently. When the notification arrived, it startled even Chogfall, who had been waiting for it. Tusks pushed against his lips, before the lips parted into a savage grin. Title, Looter of the Hamburgers, registered with Title Hunting Registry. Rarity, Unique. Registration bonus for unique title, plus 5,000 contribution points. Acquisition records and title hunt records received. Would you like to register acquisition method with the title registry of the Izumo Kiro Order of Title Hunters? Expected payout, plus 25,000 contribution points. Quarterly bonus payout, 
eligible. Yes, no. Well, Edval said, look at it yourself, Chogfall said. He showed her the first notification, the marking of its rarity. He debated, briefly, keeping how to acquire the title to himself. But with these buildings slowly disappearing, he doubted more than a couple others would ever acquire the title. And the contribution points were well worth it. Unique, Edval shouted. That's so unfair. Mine was only a semi-unique. I told you, quality is more important than quantity, Chogfall said, smirking. So saying, he adjusted his titles, making his titles on his status bar adjust. Shi Ping, seeing it for the first time, coughed and hid her grin behind her hand. Chogfall turned, glaring at the human who waved a hand. Dust, just need some water. Chogfall snorted in answer, muttering something about lacking constitution. Well, we best get started on the next title, he said. Grabbing Shiping and Kaya's, he hauled them away from Edval, who had turned around and was shouting at her own guide. A feeling of deep tranquility rose within him as he dragged the pair away. Triggering a skill to keep their conversations to themselves, he leaned down and lowered his voice. So, human, do you know of any other good titles? Maybe another one of these fast food restaurants. Shi Ping paused, eyeing the Hakarta. She'd done well, and once she got rid of her loot, she'd be even better off. Of course, his title was a little absurd if you knew human pop culture, but Chogfall seemed more focused on its rarity. Chogfall gestured, obviously wanting her to hurry up and speak. Well, there's a few other fast food chains. There's the Colonel, a military designation, and then there's the king of burgers. And, well, with each word, the Hakarta's grin widened as the trio headed off to the nearby shop orb. Kaiza's fingers were dancing, his eyes glazed, as he triggered his own skills as he attempted to divine potential titles for his employer. Grins plastered on their faces, the trio ignored their surroundings as they discussed new options. Opportunities abounded on a dungeon planet, if you knew where to look and didn't mind the odd title or two. The end. This has been Questing for Titles, a System Apocalypse short story by Tao Wong, narrated by Avon Shore. Copyright 2020 by Tao Wong. Production copyright 2021 by Tao Wong.